Those who go through the desolate valley will find it a place of springs, for the early rains have covered it with pools of water. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. If you have never seen the Grand Canyon firsthand, it's hard to appreciate its sheer size and starkness. A photo or even a video doesn't really do it justice. I learned that earlier this week when my partner George and I boarded a helicopter in Boulder City, Nevada, a short drive outside of Las Vegas, and flew east over Lake Mead and the Hoover Dam to the northern rim of the Grand Canyon in Arizona. Of course, we only saw a small portion of it since the canyon stretches 277 miles, but even this little bit of it was awe-inspiring. The helicopter weaved and dipped into the canyon between its variegated walls of umber, rust, and ochre, the Colorado River coursing gently below. When we landed, I climbed out of the helicopter onto the dusty, desolate canyon floor, which was populated by cacti and lichen, and unending shards of sandstone, limestone, and granite. From the air, the canyon appears vast, as indeed it is. But even more remarkable is the distance of time chronicled by the layers of the canyon walls, which are over a mile deep and trace the Earth's geologic history going back a whopping two billion years. The canyon's geologic layers are instructive because they tell us that the area wasn't always the barren desert landscape it is now. Each layer offers an enduring testimony to a specific period in its history. At one time, this sparse canyon was completely under the ocean, teeming with aquatic life. At another, it was lush forest. And at still another, it was volcanic. In fact, this area has gone through more ecological and geological transformations over two billion years than you can possibly imagine. In this morning's reading from the book of Jeremiah, the prophet speaks to a people experiencing their own era of barrenness. At this point in the Israelites' history, they have been exiled from their native soil and are residing as aliens in Babylon, a conquered and subjugated people. It is difficult for them to imagine any relief from the desolation that is all around them. Indeed, it pervades their very bones and consciousness as a people. As Jeremiah says elsewhere of the Israelites and their king, is this man Kaniah a despised broken pot, a vessel no one wants? Why are he and his offspring hurled out and cast away in a land that they do not know? Or... As the psalmist puts it in Psalm 31, I am the scorn of all my adversaries, a horror to my neighbors, an object of dread to my acquaintances. Those who see me in the street flee from me. I have passed out of mind like one who is dead. I have become like a broken vessel. Once a proud nation, Israel is as broken as the shards of rock littering the canyon floor. But Jeremiah's message is one of hope rather than doom and despair. He calls upon the shards, the fragments, the people he names, the remnant of Israel, to praise God and call for deliverance. These include the blind, the lame, the pregnant, the grieving. All those who weep, he assures them, will be led back home with words of consolation. Similarly, the canyon at first glance seems rather barren. But if you look more closely, you see a vibrant landscape, an ecosystem with life that has adapted to changing circumstances. Just as a great Colorado River sustains life in a harsh, dry landscape, so the Israelites' life shall become like a watered garden. And God will let the people walk by brooks of water in a straight path in which they shall not stumble. For I have become a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn, God says. In this passage, Jeremiah proves that he is a great poet as well as a great prophet. The alternating language between sorrow and joy, between Desolation and abundance emphasizes God's ability to bring life out of barrenness. 
to make all things new. But we are not able to see and understand as God does. We are often plagued by short-sightedness, only able to perceive that narrow layer in the rock that refers to our point in history without appreciating its place in a much larger narrative of life and evolution. That is why the author of the letter to the Ephesians wishes for his reading, readers, including us, to gain a spirit of wisdom and revelation. Those attributes that allow us to see beyond our limited experience to something greater. The Christmas season, which will end on Wednesday with the Feast of the Epiphany, invites us into this more expansive understanding of our place in God's time, in God's life. Like the Israelites in exile, broken humanity is given the promise of new life in the gift of God's incarnation through the Christ child. How can we possibly perceive in this little fragile child the salvation of humankind, our redemption from sin, despair, and spiritual barrenness? How indeed? There are actually three gospel readings appointed as options for this Sunday. We read one of them. And each of them is meant to open the human consciousness to the revelation of Jesus' divinity and hence humanity's salvation. Revelation is hard for human beings to accept, though. We have a tendency to want to discount it or explain it away. In two of these stories, for instance, revelation comes, as it often does in the Bible, through dreams. In the first reading from the second chapter of Matthew, the wise men, after visiting the Christ child, are warned in a dream not to return to Herod, but to travel home by another road. Later in this same chapter, the angel of the Lord urges Joseph in a dream to flee with Mary and Jesus to Egypt, because Herod is seeking the child to kill him. Modern psychotherapy has taught us that dreams can be pathways to knowledge and insight, a connection with our unconscious to which we should sometimes be attentive. In a sense, it is a source of revelation. And people in biblical times certainly understood dreams to be a platform for God to communicate deeper truths to us. The third and final gospel reading, which comes from the Gospel of Luke, offers us the only story we have of Jesus' childhood. And man, he was a precocious teenager. In this passage, the 12-year-old Jesus wanders away from his parents on their journey to Jerusalem for the Passover festival. After searching frantically for three days, they find Jesus debating with the rabbis and teachers in the temple. His parents, incredulous at the depth and maturity of the boy's teaching. Even when it's unfolding right before their eyes, Mary and Joseph can hardly believe the truth. As we move from the Christmas season toward the Epiphany season, we are meant to gradually accept the truth that God is with us, often in surprising and downright unbelievable ways. Yes, God can build a vast canyon from layers of silt and sand and decomposed organic matter. Yes, God can build a great nation from the shards and fragments of a conquered people. Yes, God can save humanity with the birth of a weak, cooing baby. Yes, God can do all these things and more. If this new year is anything like 2015, we may really need to believe that God can make things new, to repair and build up all that is broken. Terrorist attacks, school shootings, Syrian refugees, ISIS beheadings, child trafficking. Misery, cruelty, human suffering, barrenness of innumerable kinds. This is some of last year's legacy, a thin layer of silt in the record of human history. We need God more than ever if such a world continues. But like Jeremiah, the right response in the midst of all this adversity is not to give up. 
It is not to become jaded and apathetic. It is not to throw up our hands in exasperated defeat. It is to keep the image of the Christ child ever before our eyes and to perform, to perform the work of the gospel, the good news that says that Jesus, the King of kings and Lord of lords, has come to reign as the Prince of Peace on earth. Well, remember, God is with us now and forevermore. Amen.